somebody else. Hey, as a matter of fact, moving forward yeah. from this point on, I will not make reference to the PFL. Ready to get into it? Yeah, yeah. All right, oh. we're going team by team. I would be very careful about slinging stuff. Am I going to get sued? Are we going legal on this? Let's send you out on the right note. Uh, PFF sucks. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs> Welcome in to the PFF NFL podcast, Steve Palazzolo, Sam Monson, live on YouTube. And we have Dane Brugler from The Athletic on the line. We're going to get to him in just a minute. But first, is 2024 bringing exciting or unexpected changes to your life? Or here's a secret weapon to help you face those challenges with more confidence. It's a great term life insurance policy. That's right. Fabric by Gerber Life makes it simple to protect your family's financial future so you can focus on what's ahead knowing your family is protected if something else unexpected happens. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. And Fabric has flexible policies that fit your family and your budget, like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. Get your personalized quote in just minutes and then apply when it's convenient for you. It's all online and on your schedule. You can go from start to cover in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. So join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash pffnfl. That's meetfabric.com slash pffnfl. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash pffnfl. Policy is issued by Western Southern Life Insurance Company, not available in certain states. Price subject to underwriting and health questions. All right. Let's bring in Dane from The Athletic, author of The Beast. Dane, welcome back to the show. Hope all is well, man. Yeah, guys. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So The, the Beast dropped last week. Tell everybody about... Um, the most extensive draft guide in the industry. I love the PFF draft guide. I, I'm, a, I'm a company guy. I do. But yours is the most extensive. It's got uh, many, many words in there. 324 pages. Yes. There's a lot, a lot of info there, packed. 385,000 words. Um, <laughs> and, and I promise I'm not trying to make it wordy. It's just whatever's relevant, it's going to get in there. So, yeah, it's, it's really the last 18 months of my life wrapped up into uh, this this document. Um, my I, I look at my job as painting a picture you know there's, there's all these puzzle pieces you're trying to collect them all and you try to create a clear picture of who the, each one of these players uh who they are um their background their journey uh nowhere else you're gonna find pro day testing for almost 2,000 players uh in here so it's all nfl verified um and of course the all the analysis you know from understanding what a player does well where he maybe is lacking uh then they're just projection so uh it, it really is something that is I, I whether you're a diehard whether you're uh a just more casual nfl draft fan this is something that i i think you'll be happy you have by your side uh now in the lead up but all, then also on draft weekend for all three days and then even into the the PFAs and the the free agents so and all you need to do is be a, subs a subscriber to the athletic and it's included so i think it's a pretty good deal yeah it's 385,000 words and some of like the sort of strengths and weaknesses thing they're written in that like clipped you know way of sort of yeah. losing a bunch of grammatical words just to get the thing in like you've actually deliberately cut down on the number of words and it ends up as 385,000 words which is several novels worth of information it's it's insane and uh yeah, and, and, and like i said i'm not trying to be wordy i i want this to be digestible for everybody you know it's not overly uh exorbitant with uh, you know, verbose terms, and like I want this to be accessible to. Uh, doesn't matter if you're a a 25 year uh, in the NFL coach and scout, or if you're just a, a casual fan that enjoys this stuff. You know, I try to make it accessible for everybody. Yeah, so we we appreciate the hard work that goes into it. I think we talked last year about some of your process. I mean, again, there's there's background mm -hmm. information. I mean, you've got you've got it all in there, but. Uh, at the end of the day, the only thing people care about, right, is your rankings in your mock draft. So that's what we're going to talk about here today. Um, we're we're, we're going to try, Sam, to not talk about the quarterbacks. We have mm. discussed the QBs a ton on this show. Not that we don't want your takes on the quarterbacks, but I want to try to get into some of the other position groups. So let's start with this high level. I don't know how much you keep up with other people's rankings or what the perception is. Do you feel like – are there any prospects that you are higher or lower on, do you think, than – maybe the consensus or the buzz, you know, just right off the top. Uh, well, it's funny because I, I used to think that way about J.J. McCarthy, not to go right back to the quarterbacks, but okay. um, in, in back in the summer, my initial top 50 in August, uh, he was top 25, uh, a guy that I was really bullish on. I loved the tools, the traits, the intangibles. And then at some point I kind of got passed. Um, and so I'm maybe no longer leading that charge. I still believe, you know, he's a – 
mid to late first round pick, even though he's going to go in the top six picks. I think we know that. Um, but JJ McCarthy used to be one of those guys for me. Uh, now, you know, Byron Murphy from Texas, um, big fan of his. I, if you want disruptive, uh, it, it, just give me the guys that don't want to be blocked. And that's Byron Murphy. And I don't care if it's against the run, against the pass. Um, he's maybe not exactly how you would draw it up in terms of size, just around, you know, six foot one, 300 pounds. Uh, not the longest player, but he uses that natural leverage to his advantage. He has got a lot of power, a lot of uh, natural twitch through his hips, through his body. And, you know, he's a smart player. Uh, I think he understands how to, uh, you know, control gaps. He understands based off of formation, based off of what the offense is trying to do, he can put himself in position to make plays. So Byron Murphy is one of those guys for me. I, he's going to go somewhere in that 8 to 18 range. Wouldn't shock me at all if he went eight to the Falcons. It wouldn't shock me if he fell to 18 in the Bengals. And I think a couple spots in between there make a ton of sense for Byron Murphy. Um, Quinion Mitchell from Toledo is one of those guys for me as well. Uh, I just loved him over the summer. And then as the season went on, it was like, okay, yeah, this guy, forget uh, you know where I had him at like 35 overall. This guy's going first round, and this guy's going top 20. And then you go to the senior bowl, he's the best player there. And those are the combine. We expect him to run a 4-3. He does. So it's just been checking every box uh, for Quinion Mitchell. So those guys fit in that category. Um, a couple day two guys, Andrew Phillips from Kentucky, uh, definitely one of my favorite players in this draft. And usually I have trouble with guys that are smaller and don't have a ton of ball production. But I, I just you watch his tape and he's sticky. He stays attached to routes. He's really competitive. Uh, the Senior Bowl is another kind of box check for him with the way that he played. Um, so he's in that category for me. And then Marshawn Nealand from Western Michigan. Um, if you're going to – we have a good feeling for those, what, 27, 28 names that are going to be in the first round. And then it's, okay, who are the last five? Who are going to be some of those surprise players – Marshawn Nealon, I think, could be a surprise name. Uh, he plays the right position. He's a pass rusher, and he's a good-sized player, 6'3", 270, tested off the charts, and you feel like his best football is ahead of him. So uh, Marshawn Nealon snuck into that late first round. I, he's more likely to be a second rounder, but if he were to sneak into that first round, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you for a few names like Marshawn Neal and those guys that are going to go sneak into the bottom of the first round. Everybody has, you know, X number of first round draft picks and then you run out of them. And the last five picks right. in the first round are always this interesting collection of names of, well, who do you pick? If you're stuck at that spot, you run out of first round grades. You've got to, somebody's got to go. So Neeland is an interesting one. Are there any more names like that? And for Neeland in particular, where do you play him? Where do you project him at the next level? Cause he's one of these kind of tweener type players who looked more like an interior player to me on tape, but then, you know, he showed up and measured sort of a lot lighter and, you know, it would be way undersized for an interior player and showed that he has the athleticism to play on the edge. Yeah, I don't think he's not maybe the best bender, what you would think from an edge rusher, but he can set a hard edge in the run game and he is very smooth and athletic uh, at, when he gets after the quarterback. And you know, if you're going to watch one tape with uh, Marshawn Nealand, make it the Eastern Michigan tape because he just took over that game uh, from, uh, you know, whether it was rushing off the edge, whether it was just the motor never quitting. Um, he's explosive and he can win in different ways. And so that, that charged up uh, play style that he has, I, I think is going to appeal to a lot of different schemes as as an edge rusher. You think of you know the Lions picking at what twenty nine. I, I, they, we know the Lions like to do things differently. Uh, they have their own way of building their board and how they value players. If they were to, uh, to me, Neeland is a bite off a kneecap type of guy. Yeah. So uh, that wouldn't surprise me at all if uh, that is a pairing that made sense for Detroit. Um, other guys, you know, it's it's always tough to do this because I feel like there's, what, a million mock drafts out there. So at some point, I'm sure a player has been mocked in the first round. But, um, you know, Chris Jenkins from Michigan, I you know, this is a defensive tackle class that's not very strong at the top. I, I was talking about Byron Murphy. Johnny Newton uh, just had his workout at a scout tell me yesterday that even though he didn't test, he helped himself because his workout was outstanding. So Johnny Newton has a good chance to get in the first round. 
if there's a third defensive tackle that gets in there, Chris Jenkins maybe could be that guy. We know, you know, his dad was a pro bowler, different style of player, about 60 pounds less than his dad. Uh, and the production doesn't jump out at you. But then you watch a tape and you realize, OK, what is he was asked to do in terms of uh, controlling blocks? And, uh, you know, I, I think there's more in him than what the tape says. And the, the testing backs that up. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that point to Chris Jenkins being a better pro in a system that's, you know, maybe a one gap system that lets him get up the field. Um, and then stick with Michigan. I, I think that there's a lot of fans for Junior Colston, the linebacker, and Mike Sainer still from uh, as the nickel. And I don't know that they get into that first round. But again, if we have to be bold and pick maybe an underrated player that needs to be talked about in that discussion, those two guys are, are in there for me because they're top 40. They're considered top 40 picks. Junior Colson is a linebacker one for a lot of teams. And this is a linebacker class that is a lot more question marks than I think, uh, you know, it's not a deep group. And so, you know, I, I like uh, uh, Edrin Cooper. I like Cedric Gray. I like uh, Eichenberg. You know, Peyton Wilson's a lot of fun, but obviously the durability with him. A lot of teams look at Junior Colson, and even though he didn't test, he has no testing information uh, due to a hamstring injury, combine pro day. Even without that testing, I think a lot of teams look at him as the top linebacker this year and a guy that if he he's going to go somewhere probably top 40, top 50, maybe even 37 to the Chargers, reunite him and Jim Harbaugh. But if the Packers, the Cowboys, maybe they trade back a few spots and they're picking at 30 and they look at their board, they're kind of wiped out. I, I wouldn't shock me at all if Junior Colson were to sneak in there. Yeah, so you have Junior Colson as linebacker one, and in, in, in what we think is a weaker linebacker class. You mentioned you right. mentioned a bunch of names that all have question marks, whether it's medical or on field, whatever it might be. Um, it's an interesting year because it feels like the strength of the draft is in the premium positions. It feels like it's a tackle and receiver, and you know there's a lot of first round caliber corners and the whole th the whole deal. And it feels like the weaknesses are at the lower value positions, linebacker and safety, and maybe interior offensive line after the first couple. Um, where would you put the strengths and weaknesses of the draft, and how much do you think that is just NFL trends, or is it the actual uh, players, like the actual depth at some of those positions? Yeah, to your point, we're going to see the premium positions go early and often in the first round. Um, you know, we've never seen twenty offensive players in the first round before, but in in my mock draft that just came out yesterday on the Athletic. I had 21 offensive players in there, only 11 defensive players. So it's it feels like there is a a decent chance that we see that happen. Um, and it's because of the quarterbacks, the receivers, the offensive tackles. Uh, those three positions are going to fly off. And, you know, I, I do think it's because the talent warrants it, but also because you look at this tackle class, I think it, pretty, I think it falls off in the second round. I, there's talent there. You can find guys that should be able to uh, start – eventually in in, uh, in the NFL. But I do think there is a drop-off that if you don't get your tackle in the first round, I don't know that you're going to love your options on day two. And so then those, those few options are going to be off the board quickly. So even though tackle is a strong position this year, it's more top-heavy than deep, where uh, you know other positions are going to stretch, like wide receiver, corner. Those positions are strong at the top. Well, corner, so maybe... Uh, is a little up and down. You know, you're going to have Terrian Arnold, Quinion Mitchell. They're going to go early. And then where does Cooper DeGene go? Where does Nate Wiggins go? So you're, we're still going to see a handful of corners go in the first round. Receivers, uh, even though it is a deep position, there's going to be guys third round, fourth round, fifth round that you're going to like and you're going to feel like you know if we add them to our mix, we can ha have a potential, uh, in, not impact guy, but someone that's going to help our offense uh, pretty quickly. But even with that said, even with the depth, we're going to see him fly off the board. You know, we're going to see three in the top 10, a couple more round out the first round. A ton of these guys are going to go in the second round in the top 75. So even though you you feel OK waiting on a receiver if you want to, it's still a position where they're going to be flying off the board. And that, that might be the case from here on out the rest of our lives. Just because there's, it seems like every year wide receiver, there's so many of these guys. But this year does feel a little bit different, especially with those top three guys, uh, potential number ones at the top. Do you do you feel like the receiver thing is more about the the, the nature of the position? Right, you're actually you're trying to find the good stuff for a receiver because you could say, hey, he could be our three, he could be our two, he could just be a deep threat. Do you think it's easier to find the positives in a receiver versus say a tackle who you can't have weaknesses? Right, you're going to be a starter, you can't oh. be only good in one facet of the game. Do you think that's 
part of the nature of evaluating receivers versus other positions? No doubt. And I think it's, especially at certain positions, focusing on what they were asked to do in college. You know, obviously, like with offensive line, you know, it's like, okay, stop the guy in front of you or block the guy in front of you. You know, it's like we, we it, there's obviously different schemes, but we have a good feeling for uh, the offensive lineman. Whereas a receiver, maybe they were lined up as a, a slot only. Maybe they were lined up uh, outside only. Uh, you know, they, they ran a, a, a truncated uh, route tree. You know, like a guy like Brian Thomas uh, from LSU, you watch his tape and it's a lot of slants, a lot of goes, and it's like, okay, well, you know, what else can he do? And then he does run, uh, you know, a different route and you're like, okay, he can do it. I, and he has the athleticism clearly, you know, you see the testing, you just see the way he moves on the football field. He has it more in him. It's just, they weren't, he, in that LSU offense, they didn't ask him to do it. And so I do think you, maybe you give a little more leeway with receivers because like you said, the nature of the position where they're not in, in college, the number one priority for the coaches is not, hey, let's just get this guy ready for the NFL. Let's make sure he's got the full route tree, full inventory of the routes that scouts want to see. Like that's that's not doesn't even enter their brain. They okay, what does this guy do best? Boom. All right, let's do that. Let's uh, whatever's going to help us win football games. So I do think that with receivers, there's a little more uh, leeway to uh, the imagination of maybe he could do this, maybe he could do that. Uh, some receivers are stuck with bad quarterbacks, stuck in a bad offense, and okay, it's easier to um, explain away maybe why they didn't have uh, the better production uh, that you would hope to, a receiver would have that you're going to draft in the top 100. So, yeah, that, that's an interesting conversation with, with these receivers because there's so many of them. They're all a little bit different with what they offer. Yep. Um, and, and to your point, the, every team looks at them different because every team is – even though we stack all these guys in the same bucket – Johnny Wilson is ranked like close to Jacob Cowing and they're completely you couldn't be more opposite in terms of the size in terms of what they do um and so I think it's important to point out that even though these guys are all receivers they're very different with what they offer and teams based off of what they need in their scheme and their offense and you know maybe they already have an X and they just they want that true Z and it's it's very different from team to team how they look at these receivers one of the uh, things in the, the Beast is you have an amazing amount of background information on all these guys. Um, what was your favorite kind of nugget or personal story that you came across while doing all this research? Yeah, there's so many. And um, I, th that's my favorite part of doing this is just the, those journeys. And I, I think with you know, Ray Davis, the running back from Kentucky, I think a lot of people know his story um, by now. But you know, it, everything that life threw at him at an early age, you know, being in the foster care system and not really having a support system, um, you know, football kind of being his outlet. Um, but for him to not only break through and, and become a, a recruit um, and but have success at the college level um, and be, being able to lead three different college programs and rushing over the last uh, five years. And then this past year, what he did on put on tape, it's like, okay, this guy is a great story, but he's also a really good player. And I think his game against Florida might be the best single running back tape that we have this year. I was there. Um, so, I mean, he, he and you throw in the Georgia tape and he's making plays. Every single game, it felt like he was doing something. But the story to see where he's come from. And it's fun when you talk to him because every time he, he we talk about his game, I, he finds a way to mention his offensive line. So he's a really humble guy. Just an outstanding, outstanding story. Um, Quantez Stiggers, uh, the, the Canadian Football League uh, corner, who just a unique situation because he didn't attend the college. He is eligible in this draft, even though he was the rookie of the year in the CFL last year. Um, yeah, he's he's a really interesting player who, again, had to overcome a lot. You know, he uh, was going to Lane College, then he lost his father, and and he had went back home, and he's playing in basically a seven on seven indoor league, and he got a chance at a tryout in the CFL, and he turns it into this opportunity that to get on the field and make a name for himself, and now he's he's going to be a draft pick uh, somewhere on day three for a, a team looking for corner help. So that, that's uh, all these guys go through so many different things, uh, whether it's and some tougher than others, but finding out 
you know, were they multi-sport athletes growing up? Uh, oh, J.J. McCarthy was a big-time hockey player growing up? Okay. I, and, you know, that that's where he gets his toughness from because he was a – he he at one point he thought he'd go pro as a hockey player. Um, or, you know, Joe Alt, Notre Dame, you know, he didn't play offensive tackle till his senior year of high school. His dad was a Pro Bowl tackle in the early 90s. Like, how does that work? And, oh, you find out – he, that was on purpose. He, his son, he's his dad wanted uh, Joe to be an athlete first, and so he's a quarterback. He's a tight end. He's playing all these different sports, and then finally, okay, senior year, let's let's get you more offensive line or get you some offensive line, uh, an introduction to this sport or to this position. And then he goes to Notre Dame, and you see year over year big time improvements made. And part of that is because of the way that he grew up being an athlete first. So a lot of interesting uh, uh, little tidbits and things as you go through these players and you pick up different things and so it, it's a big it's a probably the most enjoyable part of my process as i do this love that yeah I mean, again the beast is packed with all those the background information the personal stories and basically you know everybody's path to um path to the draft here um i want to talk some of the position groups and you know kind of hot button guys you know, you know rankings and I, sometimes you're splitting hairs between one two and three but um, one of the position groups, edge rusher, we talked a little bit about, you know, a Marshawn Nealon sneaking in the first, but it's pretty clear top three with Dallas Turner. You have Dallas Turner, Jared Verse, and then Layatu Latu. We've been big Latu fans here because of that production, obviously the uh, the medical injury. How do you, how do you, how did you separate those three guys and how do you, how would you, uh, what, what are the debates like, I think, when you're trying to sort through those top three edges? Yeah, and it's it's always tough for those of us on the outside. Obviously, we don't have near the information that teams do when it comes to medical and character. And um, yeah, a great example last year, Puka Nakua. He graded out as a as a day two receiver, but you know he you drop him in your rankings because the he couldn't stay healthy in the medical stuff, and he ended up falling on draft weekend because of that. And obviously, we saw how that worked out. Uh, but a player like Liatu Latu, who has had to medically retire. Uh, even though he has been healthy the last two years, played in every game uh, for for UCLA, how do you how do you weigh that? You can't completely ignore it. Uh, but so it, it's part of the conversation. Um, I think with these, this is not maybe the the best group of edge rushers, but those three guys at the top are really talented. And with Latu, you love that he's not just throwing stuff out there uh, with his his rush moves. You know, a lot of college players, that's because they're so used to being bigger and faster and stronger than everybody. So, you know, their rush moves, their their sequencing is underdeveloped uh, in terms of the timing and, and, and what they do. But with Latu, it's it's a dance. It, it, it is a, a very coordinated and calculated attack for him with how what he's going to do for to offensive linemen. And that's tape study. That's know-how. Um, that's just a very strong technical understanding of how to play the position. And that's something that you feel like is going to translate. So he's not you – know, the size is good, not great. The athleticism is good, not amazing. He's not some superhuman athlete. But his understanding of how to play the position, I think you you see that. And, okay, that's that's going to translate pretty well. Dallas Turner ended up number one for me among these edge rushers because I think you know, you love – the athleticism and the upside, but he also has production. Uh, I mean, he led the SEC in sacks this year, um, but he's a guy at 6'3", 250. You could stand him up and play, let him play Mike Linebacker. He could do it no problem. He is that type of freaky athlete, uh, He, but he can lock out, stop the run. Um, he's, he's one of these guys where he's not as savvy as a pass rusher in terms of how to uh, you know, use his moves to break down uh, the rhythm of blockers, but he has it in him. It's just a matter of coaching and experience. So he's not Will Anderson. He's not that type of – doesn't have that type of nuance just yet. But the freaky athleticism, the ability – the fact that he does like to stop the run – and it just the, so you you bet on that upside, and I think that's why he's probably the favorite to be the first defensive player drafted. You know, you look at Atlanta at eight, maybe even the Bears at nine. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see, but he's going to go pretty early. Uh, and Jared Verse, he's just, I mean, he's so easy to like because the, the energy that he plays with, it's nonstop. Um, he, the way he can convert his speed to power is really impressive. Um, maybe you wish there was. He did. He, he didn't rely on that so much, uh, just because he is, you know, he's six four, two fifty five. He's not this, um, you know, he, he's he's not the size of a DeForest Buckner uh, out there doing that. So maybe you wish there was 
a little more uh, secondary options to w- the way he rushes, but still he, he gets results. He's disruptive. So all three of these guys, I think they're they're different with why you like them, which makes it interesting when you try to stack them one through two, three. But that's also why teams are very different with their order of one, two, three, and, and even Chop. I throw Chop Robinson in there as well because teams will. If you can do one thing really, really, really well, they will latch onto that and run with it. And with Chop Robinson, that first step is unmatched. And teams look at that and say, give me that. We'll work on the rest. W- will McDonald went top 15 last year. You know, kind of similar Justifiable type of situation. So. Yeah. Um, I think everyone tends to see the, this quarterback class as pretty much the same, at least in terms of tiers, right? It's the top guys, the ones that are going to go in the first round. Then it's the where are you on Bo Nix, Michael Penix conversation. And then everybody's favorite of the rest is Spencer Rattler. But if you had to bet of, of all the remaining guys, once you get beyond Spencer Rattler, who's going to be the next Brock Purdy? If you have to put your money on mm-hmm. one of those guys, who would it be? I would go with Michael Pratt from Tulane. Um, you look at what he did at, at Tulane with that offense. Uh, they won a lot of games after they had, they had that tough was a 2021 season, and then they helped turn them around, uh, had, had a really good 2022 season. Uh, he's young, still growing, still developing, but I think he does a lot of things well. And uh, you know, you talk about the rhythm from the pocket, his accuracy. He's a good athlete, so he can move around. He's very clean with his mechanics. Um, I I think he's going to continue getting better in terms of his reaction to pressure. Um, Just understanding, okay, this is my hot route. This is what where the pressure is coming from. This is where just going through all those things. I think he will get better. So I, to me, he is an NFL backup. But if he gets a chance to start. I think he's got a chance to stick. A, a, a guy that once he gets on the field, he has the right mentality. He's got the toughness. Um, you know, and, and you talk to the coaches at Tulane, and they just they they rave about him. It's the work that he puts in, uh, his teammates back that up. They they say the same type of things about him. So uh, he has not a, an A plus arm, but a a B arm, good enough arm. But more so than that, he's accurate. He understands where to go with the football. Um, he's a good athlete, good size athlete. And uh, I think he's smart. I think he's got the toughness. So probably won't go until day three. But somewhere in the fourth round, I would rather bet on him than, say, uh, a Devin Leary or a Joe Milton or some of these other quarterbacks. I, I got to tell this story quickly because um, sometimes when I'm watching film, like I, I watch film at various points, you know, different places, whatever. And so uh, – when I think of Michael Pratt, I was uh, I started watching his film back in December while I was at the airport picking up my wife and kids from a trip while I was dressed up as Elf. So I was sitting in the airport dressed as Elf, grinding Michael Pratt film. So, you know, that's when I think of Pratt. When he gets drafted, I'm going to associate it with being at the airport dressed as Elf and everybody waving saying, hey, buddy. That was... It's a good thing you're you're a smaller guy, so people would probably didn't notice you. Uh, Not noticed yeah, at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> throw that into my my background notes. Um, I want to get to your mock draft in a minute, but one of the guys to highlight there is you went with what everybody else is doing here: Brock Bowers to the Jets at ten. Um, I want to yeah. discuss Brock Bowers a little bit. What's that conversation like? Because a lot of people are saying, do you take a tight end in the top ten? And T.J. Hawkinson didn't develop till year four, and Kyle Pitts hasn't lived up to the hype after the one year. How do you how do you break down Brock Bowers and where he should go in the draft? Yeah, it, it, and it's tough when you look at the you can't debate the track record of tight ends uh, in the top half of round one, but I think we become so obsessive with the the T and the E next to his name. What if we just call him a slot receiver? How does how does our uh, opinion change, our perspective change, or let's just call him a dynamic weapon? And usually I'm opposed to that, but that's kind of what he is. I mean, you can line him up out wide, you can line him up in the slot, and you can line him up in the backfield. Make defenses account for him on every single play, um, and, and the dynamic ways he can make plays down the field. Whether it's it could be a jet sweep, it could be working down the seam. It just he, he can has the toughness to work over the middle. His ball skills are outstanding, uh, and then after the catch, he is such a threat because of the speed, but also the toughness. He he finds those hidden yards where for most tight ends it's a, a five yard gain. He f- makes it an eight-yard gain, and that makes all the difference when it's you know third and two and not third and five. So I, I think that there's just so much that he offers, and you're encouraged by the fact that you look at that 
that 2021 Georgia roster and you've got guys like George Pickens and Adonai Mitchell and um, a, a lot of talent. And yet it was still Brock Bowers who's leading that team and receiving uh, it made such a dynamic impact as a true freshman uh, for a national title winning team. And so it's not like this. He's had to grow to this point. He he was the guy from day one. He's just a little bit different than, you know, because you're if you draft him, you're not plugging him in as the why and just set it and forget it and run your offense. You have to have an understanding of, OK, we're going to make him a feature part of our offense by doing this, this and this. And as a general manager, you better trust your play caller to understand how to use a guy like this. So that's a big part of this. And, you know, if you're. Uh, Chris Ballard, and you're looking at that Steichen offense, and you, I, as long as you guys are on the same page, I, I think that that'd be a great fit for Brock Bowers. Uh, you think about Sean Payton, uh, they're picking what 12th, uh, Jimmy Graham, what he was, uh, in, with the Saints, and you go back to Jeremy Shockey, uh, back in the day when Sean Payton coached him, different types of tight ends, but an understanding of okay, this guy is a little bit different, uh, let's make sure we're using him in the right way. So I think it's almost more up. It's, it's the onus is on the coaches to make this work more so than the player because the player has the talent. It's just a matter of okay, can the general manager trust the coaching staff to use him in the right way to justify why we're drafting him in the top ten? And I think Brock Bowers is the type of guy you take a chance on. And that that positionless designation thing is effectively like the Bills did that last year, right? They came out and immediately yeah. said. Dalton Kincaid is basically going to be our big slot. Like, he's not a tight end. Mm -hmm. He's he's going to be replacing Cole Beasley in this offense. Think of him in those terms. That's what he's going to do. And, okay, he didn't have, you know, 1,000 yards or anything, but he was a productive player for them and was getting better as the year went on. No doubt. And he'll be a big part of this offense moving forward. Um, so, yeah, Brock Bowers – even if you know the rookie year isn't a thousand yards receiving, and you know I, as you look move forward for this offense, uh, he's going to be a big part of it. And and the Jets are in a win now uh, situation where, uh, and that's always tough because Aaron Rodgers hasn't necessarily always been the most supportive of rookies coming in right away and being making a big in impact. He wants veterans. He wants guys who know where to go. But to me, Bowers feels like one of those guys where he's going to know the playbook. He's not going to make a ton of mental mistakes. And the ones that he that he does make, it, he won't make them again. He won't make them a second time. So I do think that's why you look at the Jets. He fits both as a, as a player and what he brings to that offense, but also kind of the makeup of that team and what they're trying to do as a win-now uh, team. And so... Yeah, Bowers is the wild card, right? I mean, he, I think he goes somewhere in the top 15. It's just a matter of, okay, is it going to be the Jets at 10? Is it going to be the Broncos at 12? Colts at 15? Are we going to see some type of trade-up situation or trade-back situation or maybe a wild card team we're not even talking about? He, he really is uh, that wild card at the top half of round one. Yeah, the more the more I think of it, you mentioned it earlier, Dane, when, when a team says a guy can do one thing really well, I mean, if you're not going to get one of those top three receivers – there's some right. team that's going to say, I want Brock Bowers in my offense. I need that guy. So I, I, right. I'm, I'm leaning more toward he becomes a top 10 player that some team is coveting. Uh, let's go to your seven-round mock here. Uh, I assume this isn't your final mock. I know how the business works. You have to knock out at least right. three or four before draft night here. But the extensive seven-round mock, um, nothing crazy at the top, but you got the, the Vikings trading up for J.J. McCarthy. We see... We see this often, and you, and you leaned into the the Cardinals replicating what they did last year—a trade back from four, and then a trade back up to get Marvin Harrison Jr. That took the Chargers out of the pick five, and they trade down and get J.C. Latham, the tackle. Chargers fans are going to hate that. They don't want a tackle; they want a receiver. But um, what? How do you expect that top? Like, what do you think happens after the top few quarterbacks go off the board here? Yeah, these receivers are going to go. Um... You know, it's kind of some parallels to the 2021 draft where we saw three quarterbacks uh, go, uh, and then it was three pass catchers with Pitts and Jamar Chase and, and Waddle. Um, and, and then we saw the tackle with Penny Sewell at seven. It's kind of some parallels this year where we're going to see the quarterbacks go one, two, three, and then okay, where's that fourth quarterback come off the board? Um, and the thing that's going to, you know, we know Caleb's going to go one. He's going to be a Chicago Bear. The thing that's going to throw everything off is if J.J. McCarthy becomes that second or third quarterback off the board. And we really that's what's going to throw everything right? off because really all of a sudden, all, I think we'll have more teams in the hunt to trade up for, look, look, let's just say J.J. McCarthy. Let's say Jane Daniels goes two 
J.J. McCarthy goes three of the Patriots. Drake May, all of a sudden, if you're the Cardinals, you're loving it because the call of a sudden that Cardinals pick is be your phone is blowing up. Whether it's the Giants at six, the Vikings at eleven, I think the Broncos at twelve are very much in play there. They would not hesitate to trade future picks to get up to number four to get that quarterback. So I that that's going to be the kind of the wrench in this whole thing is is it chalk where it's okay Jane Daniels Drake May in whatever order two and three and then we just kind of figure out where JJ McCarthy goes with the fourth uh, quarterback off the board if the order is disrupted that's where I think things get really interesting and that could really disrupt how these receivers come off the board and you know how, what's the order you know, Joe Alt to the Titans feels. Almost, it makes too much sense. Like, so it's not going to happen. Um, you know, we'll see how that plays out. When's the first defensive player come off the board? Uh, that's only once, and it was that 2021 draft. Only once in the 57 years uh, in the Super Bowl era of NFL drafts have we seen offense go one through seven. So in this year, who knows if the Falcons say they they have several guys on their board that they rate very similar. You know, Quinion Mitchell and Dallas Turner and Verse and these guys. Maybe they trade back and a uh, team trades up to get Roma Dunze at eight. And all of a sudden, we've got eight. Uh, we've got offensive players one through eight. We might have offensive players one through ten. This is an offensive heavy first round. And I, I, there's going to be a lot of intrigue because we're going to see some trade action. Uh, you know, the Cardinals and Chargers are, are willing to move out of there. They're willing to be a, a little aggressive with how they move around. Um, but, you know, this is a draft where if you can get – you want to be picking top 10, so I don't think you want to trade back too far. But if you can pick up an extra two, an extra three, like most drafts, I think that's kind of the sweet spot. And for a team like the Chargers, you are got a brand-new regime. You're trying to turn over the roster with young, in, young, inexpensive talent that fits your vision, your mold for what you're trying to build. The Chargers, I think, would be more than willing to get out of there, and they can build the uh, L.A. Wolverines down there. <laughs> I was I was trying to interrupt you for a minute. I apologize, but the the Jaden Daniels to two to the Commanders that's not really locked in, right? I think we're all feeling no. that buzz, but actual information coming out of Washington, I don't think. I, I don't know how much do you trust anything coming out of Washington? They've been pretty mom, I would say, in this this whole process. All the buzz about Jaden Daniels at two is coming from other teams. You know, that's that's what other teams feel like the commanders are going to do. Uh, the commanders aren't giving away anything at this point. Um, and I doubt they will uh, just because it, and it's it's interesting with a brand new regime. You have a, a new owner who will have his thumb on the scale. Uh, you have a first year general manager. You, you've got a coach in his second go around as the head guy, but he's a defensive coach. So he brings a different perspective to this. Um, I could certainly understand, even though to me, Drake May is the second best quarterback this year. I could certainly understand if they come away thinking Jaden Daniels and everything he offers is you know, the best fit for them. Uh, but yeah, I, no, there, by no means would I call it a, a done deal. And, and I'm sure the commanders have a clear leader in the clubhouse of who they want to take, but they're still doing their work. Uh, you know, you, you talk to general managers who have drafted quarterbacks in the past and they'll tell you, yeah, we had a good feeling it was this guy, but it wasn't until the end that we really knew it uh, because they continue to do work and uh, make sure they're making the, the right decision. So th th I, I do think that regardless of who they draft, we're going to see the commander stay at two. And I think we're going to see the command or the Patriots stay at three. I mean, I, you look at Robert Kraft I and mean, he's 82 years old. He just got done watching the worst offensive season. The Patriots have had in his uh, tenure as an owner. He's not going through that again. You know, he wants to inject some life into this offense and, you know, no disrespect to Jacoby Brissett, but that it, it, it's just not going to be enough. I mean, they need to draft a quarterback, and I think they will be fine doing it at number three, even though I do think they're going to get some pretty lucrative trade offers to move back. I just think that it's going to be hard to trade away from one of these quarterbacks. Yeah, Belichick on, on McAfee, I think, yesterday was saying accurate information from within teams is not coming out until 12 hours before the draft. Everything that's coming out now – is agent driven it's other people it's I, it's not necessarily the accurate information there's probably truth to that however last year the information that came out 12 hours before the draft was will levis going at two that was the, the betting market yeah. putting levis at two so let's just you know well it doesn't mean that the only information coming out 12 hours is accurate that's a good point that's a good point the oh, yeah okay that's fair um sam do you have anything any other questions on the mock yeah well so um just in terms of we're talking about trades and everyone's focusing on, you know, teams trading up to get the quarterbacks. It, there, are, there are other players in this draft that have been talked about as, you know, here's somebody worth trading up for. If you were going to project players that are going to get 
uh, capture somebody's attention and be the subject of a team trading up to get them in the first round, who would you flag for that? We got to mention the Bills, right? Um, they're in a spot where they could they could stick and pick at uh, at twenty eight, but we know they have a need at, at wide receiver, and it depends on how they view these guys. Um, you know, do they after the top three? Let's just say they don't make a Julio Jones trade. How do they stack up with Brian Thomas Jr. and Adnay Mitchell and Ladd McConkey and Keon Coleman, all these guys? Is there a clear number one or is they closely grouped together and they're fine with whoever falls to them? So how the Bills view these receivers is a, a big point of the conversation. Um, it, we know Brandon Bean's not shy to be aggressive in the draft. He will move up if he sees uh, someone that he feels is worth moving up for. He's done it in several first rounds, did it last year with Dalton Kincaid. So I, I think that'll be interesting what the Bills do. Um, you know, the, the offensive linemen, it, the kind of the – the musical chairs uh, of how the offensive linemen are going to fall, um, you know, w- between, you know, we're going to see, I think the over under is nine and a half offensive linemen in the first round. And there's a good chance we see double digit offensive linemen. So I think that'll be interesting just to see how those guys uh, mix and match. Um, but I think you know, we're going to see plenty of trade action this year. There, there's no doubt about it. You know, you see the, the commanders in the early second round, they've kind of painted themselves into a corner with their tackle situation. They're going to draft a quarterback at two, but then they need a tackle at left tackle and someone that can play pretty early. Are they, you know, they have those two picks, uh, was it 36 and 40? Uh, they, they, are they going to package those picks and maybe go get a Tyler Guyton or, uh, you know, a tackle they feel like they can step in and, and be the guy that protects the blind side? Uh, or are they going to stay put and draft a Kingsley Suamatia or Patrick Paul or one of those guys? So the commanders are certainly a team to watch with those two picks in the top 40. Well, Dane, we could do this all day, talk and draft. We love it. We appreciate the hard work that you do. Once again, tell everybody where they could get the beast and where you're going to be on draft night. Tell everybody uh, where they could find you over the next week or so. Yeah, just need a subscription to The Athletic. And like I said, that that draft guide's included. And it's I, I promise you will not be disappointed uh, when, when you get that and have it by your by your side for, for draft weekend. Um, I'll be in Detroit. Uh, myself, uh, Robert Mays, Nate Tice, we'll be doing The Athletic Football Show live from Detroit. We'll be covering every pick, first two nights, uh, first three rounds. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, follow us on YouTube. Uh, we'll be doing that. Uh, have a bunch of screens open, you know, so you, you can follow all the the fun coverage that'll be out there. And um, it, it's, uh, I, I mean, as much as I enjoy talking about what's going to happen, it's even more fun talking in the moment when picks happen, and we can say, oh, so this is why they did this, and the, this is their vision for that. That's a that's one of my favorite parts about doing this. Yeah, it's awesome. We love it. Again, um, appreciate you joining us again, Dane, and uh, everybody go uh, go check out Dane's work over at the Athletic. Thanks, man. Thanks, Dane. Thanks so much, guys. All right, take care. I like that as an idea. He can uh, remember that guy that sends us his setup every year, his like yes. war room that's got like fifteen TVs. Mm-hmm. Well, each one of them can be like a different stream, right? I'm, we could have Dane and the athletic guys on one screen, us in the PFF studio on another screen. You know, perfect. I am not going to lie, but um, I want that guy set up. Well, I w- Bill Belichick's going to be live, yes, with McAfee. Pat McAfee, and I'm not going to lie, as you know, we're going to be live. We're we're competing. I we're competing it- with Pat McAfee and Bill Belichick, and there's a part of me that you know, kind of wants to get Bill's insight it's fa- on draft it night. It is fascinating. We need to have that up on that TV over there. Um, it's funny. He was sort of talking on McAfee, and he's like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm watching all these guys tape because we're doing our show. I'm, I'm in. At one point, they were talking about, you know, we know the hit rate on wide receiver. I think it was wide receivers and quarterbacks. Wide receivers and quarterbacks, like 50-50. It's like, well, for you it might be. <laughs> like, I'm not sure it is for everybody else at the moment. The, the hit rate on wide receivers seems to be a little bit better than that for most people at the moment. You, sure. You I, know. Bet, I bet Bill loves Keon Coleman. Yes. He loves Keon Which Coleman. Which scares me. Right. Now, oh, added to the Keon Coleman propaganda file that I'm keeping open. Yeah. He is C.D. Lamb's cousin. C.D. Lamb's Positive. cousin. Positive. Now, here, I, I want to go in a little bit. I need, so there needs to be gradations of that nugget of information, right? For example, I have cousins I've never met, right? Yeah. Is that a positive? Like if my if one of the cousins that I'd never met happens to be like a Nobel Prize winner in something. Yeah, yeah. Do Blood I lines. get a boost for that? Bloodlines. But Blood. then but the other thing is I also need to know what what level of cousin are we talking about here? Is it a first cousin? Is it a second cousin? Cuz you know, this thing can get pretty loosey goosey. Yeah. If we're talking about a second cousin that you've never met, that's not helping. It's it's uh, 
It's the bloodline. If it's stuff. a first cousin with, you, you know, think that's okay. With well, if it's a first cousin with, you know, deep bloodline connections who you train with every Sunday, now we're talking. That's like a positive like CD Lamb in that case helps Keon Coleman. If CD Lamb so happens you're to be throwing that as a positive in the propaganda right. file. Whereas if CD Lamb happens to be like a second cousin once removed that he's never met, it's probably <laughs> not helping. Not as good. Yeah. Well, I've got, um, you know, I was watching Air Force Safety Trey Taylor yesterday. Yes. Uh, might be a late round model guy. And then you see, not only is he Ed Reed's cousin. Good, good. Big age difference there, but there, he's Ed Reed's right. cousin. See, this is what I'm saying. Like, but what, what type of cousin? According to the Beast, they, they talk safety play. They talk. They're not just... So he's you know, met him at least. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They 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 talk. Right. And they they talk shop. But I feel like when, so that's another. I feel like when you Trey drop Taylor. that, you know, this guy is this guy's cousin. I need more information than that in order to to know what to do with that nugget. I need what type of cousin and what kind of relationship do they have? Otherwise, don't tell me that because it could be anything. It's important to me that the supplements that I take are of the highest quality, Sam. I would that's why for the so. last couple of years, we've been drinking AG One. Unlike many supplement brands, AG One conducts relentless testing to set the standard for purity and potency. AG1 is constantly searching for how to do things better at 52 iterations of their formula and counting. Their team is always trying to find better ways to source, test, and aim to find the best quality ingredients available. Available. It's researched and developed by an in-house team of scientists, doctors, and nutritionists with decades of experience in their respective fields. So, so many people have asked me if AG1 is actually the real deal, and it is. There's a reason why we've been drinking it for so long here on the PFF NFL podcast. So quality for AG1 isn't just a buzzword. It's a commitment backed by expert-led scientific research, high-quality ingredients, industry-leading manufacturing, and rigorous testing. At each step of the process, AG1 goes above and beyond industry standards. So we've partnered with AG1 AG for so long because they make such a high-quality product that we genuinely look forward to drinking every single day. So if you want to replace your multivitamin and more, Start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin, th- vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first subscription over at drinkag1.com slash PFF. That's drinkag1.com slash PFF. Go check it out right now. Um, again, I, do, I, I really do enjoy talking to Dane. He makes this his entire life. I assume, I mean, he says it's 18 months of work, meaning the beast for 2025 already has. Right, began. Right, he's got background information. Before. He's got It's got a lot a lot in there. Um, I will say, when you look at his seven-round mock, we've been calling this a, uh, you know, at this time of the year, the draft is chalk, right? I mean, the expectations are um, similar for a lot of different mock drafts. I think there's a lot of similarities, but if, I also agree with Dane, We because of the quarterbacks, could see a lot of trades the cardinals the chargers kind of holding the cards there and you know he has that he has a couple of those trades at four and five so that's why i can't wait i'm we're gonna be live on draft night reacting and that is the most fun watching what teams are actually doing in real time the parallels to 2021 is interesting because remember that year pre-draft the conversation was a lot about how many quarterbacks can we get in the top five like how many of these five guys that we all like in the first round can we sort of shoehorn consecutively in those top few picks? This year, very early, it was like QBs are going one, two, three, and then maybe four if somebody wants to trade up for that fourth guy. It's going to be interesting to see if if that happens, right? If somebody actually does make that trade, jump up to four for a J.J. McCarthy or whoever the fourth guy is, or if actually, you know, when we get – because we had this a bit last year as well, right, with those guys, and ultimately – once QB4 was there, everyone was like, no. <laughs> not, not only are we not trading up for him, but actually we're going to let him slide out of the first round entirely. And some Does of that, that happen here where, you know, Dane says, J.J. McCarthy is not the fourth. Like, and B- Boog on ESPN was railing against this. He's like, you're trying to tell me he's the fourth best player? Number one, no. Nobody's trying to tell you that. Number two, like, that's the current thing. He's not worth that in abstract terms, but he's a quarterback, so everyone's like, well, everyone – Anyone that needs a quarterback's got to trade up there to get him. But does that act, every time we think that it tends to not actually manifest, and teams are a little bit more self-restrained than that, and do let that slide happen. The reason why JJ McCarthy could slide. So the the betting market over at Circa came out with over unders on where guys would get picked, and yeah. the thing that stood out to me was Michael Penix Jr. and Bo Nix basically being right at thirty two. I forget the exact number. The expectation was that they're going to p- get picked, you know, higher or lower than thirty-two. Right? So. Are they? Yeah. And and we've been debating. And look, I, I I've said before, I wouldn't be surprised if there were some teams who were, who who would be willing to pick Michael Penix Jr. in the top ten. 
Yeah. I just I wouldn't be surprised by that. I'll say, um, but you need you, there's only so many teams to pick. That's where that number comes from. Plus, it's the buzz. Plus, it's probably this assumption that okay, there'll be a top three that goes. And then to your point, does JJ McCarthy then fall? Because the other thing that happened it might last not be year, him, by because the way, like it's, it could be Drake May. It could be Drake May. If all like so far, we've talked to a bunch of people, one of whom thinks Drake May is actually the the, the best quarterback. That's not out yet, right? That's coming this week. But one of whom thinks JJ or Drake May is the best quarterback available. All of his sort of flaws or negatives are eminently fixable, and he'll be good. Everyone else is terrified of Drake May and actually going, dude, there's some real problems here. Don't love it. It's entirely possible Drake May becomes QB four and the guy that slides, as well as you know it being JJ McCarthy. Um, the other point I was going to make, like we don't know so it's easy to look at last year where Bryce Young went one CJ Stroud two Anthony Richardson goes four yep and then Will Levis was the fourth quarterback off the board was supposed to be the fourth QB off the board and he didn't go until the second round Mm -hmm. however the Titans by all reports were trying to trade into the first right to get Will Levis so the results are often driven by you know things out of the control right for for the for the rest of Eternity, Will Levis is a second-round quarterback. But if a trade could have just been worked out with the Titans, he's a first-round quarterback. So yeah, there's a but, fine line between... Right, but the point is they passed on him, right? Like they were Oh, they did. They passed 11. on him at 11. Right. Yes. So that's the thing. Like, they said, not, give, me the guard, give me the guard conversion right. first. Right. So like yeah. in, this, in this, if you translate that to this draft, right? If a team like, you know, a team like Denver or the Raiders or whatever could be trying to trade back into the first round for that guy... But they also could have just taken him at 12 or 13 or whatever, right? Or the Vikings, you know? They could trade up. They could, the Vikings could do anything. They have the ammunition to get pretty much anywhere in this draft. Uh, or they could sit there at 11 and select a quarterback. Or they could pass on a quarterback at 11, grab one later at 23, whatever. My point being, you know, if right now we're sort of going, QBs are going 1, 2, 3, 4. But in that realm of, in that spectrum, whoever QB4 is, they could go number four overall. They could go anywhere from 4 to 11 with a team trading up to get ahead of Minnesota. They could go number 11 if Minnesota has the discipline to sit there, wait, uh, trust the board, and assume that that guy is going to slip to them. Minnesota could pass on that guy, and they could go anywhere from 4 to 23 when the Vikings come up again, or uh, from 11 to 23 when the Vikings come up again. Or it could be like a Will Levis style fall where everyone's like, nah, I'm not taking that guy. See, I don't think that there's. I, I think there's more QB needy teams this year. Maybe, but there's more QB. You, I don't think it happens either. But if you were saying this a year ago that one of these four guys is going to slip out of the first round entirely, you would have been told you were an idiot. You know what I mean? So we, yeah. it's like we don't know. I don't want to be as told much, I'm an idiot. I don't either. But as much as everyone is saying it's going QB one, two, three, four, like one of these guys might not. One of these guys could slide easily, and not just slide to to eleven, slide further than that. Like if you're looking at this and saying. We don't think QB4 is, is, is good. Why would you take him at 11 or 12 or 13? Just because you need a QB? Like, either don't take him then, come back in the second round, or take a different guy. I think guy. That, that's going to depend on how you tier the quarterbacks. Right. Because there, there will be some buildings where QB4, I'm going to call it J.J. McCarthy right now. Okay. There's going to be some buildings where J.J. McCarthy is closer to Penix, Knicks, Or simply not even Rattler. like QB4. Like, there, there will be buildings, there will absolutely be buildings that have uh, Michael Penix in particular ranked higher than one of those four guys. Yes. I mean, I know that for a fact. Right. So, so yeah. you know, those guys could contribute to QB4, the consensus QB4 sliding, right? Like, if one of the Raiders, if the Raiders just select Michael Penix Jr. at 13, whilst J.J. McCarthy or whoever QB4 is, is on the board that contributes to his slide. I, I always love the insider reports that are like, this quarterback was the number one quarterback on 17 boards, right. or at least 17 boards. Like you have enough contacts and you got that exact question out to at least 17 teams to tell you the number one QB and you can report that. Those are always interesting right. ones. We, that's enough QB talk. We said we were gonna st- would not do it. And we're Ends doing the it. QB. Um, other things we need to talk about. Did you see <laughs> what Washington did yesterday? with prospects coming in for visits. Yeah, so you wanted to talk court, their quarterback visits. No, they, they did not just bring in all the quarterbacks. Oh, they went to Top Golf. Did you hear what they did? How many people do you think Washington had in yesterday? 
oh, prospect. I oh, I didn't see all. I just heard all the quarterbacks coming. Same. In. That's what I thought it was, right? It turns out it was significantly more than that. They brought everybody. Guess how many they brought in? 15. 30. Washington brought in 30 prospects yesterday. They did all their 30 visits in one day? They, they brought in 30 prospects at the same time at the end, right? Went to Top Golf, as you said, including the top quarterback prospects. Went to Top Golf. Uh, apparently, the rationale for this, I was listening to Burt Breer on Rich Eisen. The rationale for this was essentially, okay, they've spent, they've had a bunch of one on ones with all these guys already, right? They've had their, you apparently, you're like three Zoom calls up to an hour each. Uh, in addition to the combine time that you get, blah, blah, blah. They've had plenty of one-on-one time, and they will have more one-on-one time during the visit where they're actually there. But what they wanted to do was say, all right, this is as late as we're going to get in the process. The deadline for the 30 visits is yesterday, I think. So it was the last day they could do it, which means you are the furthest along in the process you can possibly be. You have the most information. You're, you're basically set. So what they want to do is they want to get everyone in, all 30 guys in, like create this environment of like a team, you know, like a team environment. And then they want to watch. Watch them interact with their teammates. And they want to see who the alpha is, who emerges as the leader in the group, right? We're selecting one of these QBs. Which one are the 30 people going to gravitate to, you know? Does J.J. McCarthy, is he going to be the alpha? Or is that he just going to actually hang around the periphery and let, let Jaden Daniels take over? So that's what they wanted to do. And then you bring them to Top Golf, add some competition into the, th- the whole thing, dynamic. Gotta love that. Gotta love that. I'm, so I'm just interested in where you weigh that, right? Not to get too nerdy on this, but everything, everything's like whether you want it to be or not, it's an equation, right? It's some sort of mathematical equation because at the end of the day, you need to put a number next to a player's name. But also, right? So where does this weigh? You know, like so, if if they might have, they may have graded Drake May after all of that other stuff as the top quarterback, but if Jaden Daniels the top golf alpha, yeah, how much how much do you weigh? Is that you know, is that twenty? Is, is your your final is often twenty percent of your grade, right? Is is it twenty percent? But also, do the players know that when they're like when? Of course you know, they do. If they know, all... hey, I'm going to. They know, right? We've heard enough. The agents agents are in tune to this they want to see you so So then they're playing the game too so what are the instructions the agent is issuing to each one of these guys knowing that they are being sent to this lord of the fly or yeah lord of the flies type environment where you have to emerge as the kid with the conch right are they sending him in there going is is drake may's agent sending him in there going look Here's, here's, the, here's the SP, Drake, right? You are being sent in there. You need to be the guy, right? So you go in there and alpha harder than everybody else and make sure that everyone gravitates to you. Are they just like As all a, the quarterbacks are there trying to out alpha each other and get the, the environment gravitating to them? As, so this is what, as a data guy, I would love to know if the top golf experiment had happened over the last 10 years, and you did this with the 2017 class, and you have you have Mahomes, Watson, and Trubisky mm-hmm. in the top golf experiment. Do you think Mahomes wins? Right? Do you think do you think the and it's not even a win or loss type of thing? But well, forget the top a lot golf. of these psychology experiments are not you know who's better, who's worse. It's just you know the value. It's it's subjective, right? This sub- yeah. eye of the beholder, like this is the best outcome type of thing. Well, not like this is this guy's number one. This this guy's two three. Would in 2018, would Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson rise to the top over Baker Mayfield, well, Sam Donald, thing, right? and Josh Rosen? Top golf feels like it's muddying the waters. Let's forget top golf for the moment. Let's... I'm calling it the top golf experiment, but it's the, Fine. It's, the, it's the. But the idea being, like, if you threw 40 people in a room with the 2021 draft class of QBs, which one of the five first rounders would be the alpha? Which one would they all gravitate to? In it's which... not Mac Jones. We know that for in a 2021? fact. 2021? Yeah. It's not going to be Mac. It's probably not going to be Zach Wilson. It's one of the other three. But Trevor's so like cool and laid back. I yeah. don't know if that I don't know if that would play. But it's Trevor Fields. It's probably Fields. not Lance either. It's Trevor Fields. Probably. So it's getting yeah. you. Yeah, and if it's, it's getting you part it, of the way. And if there. you say Trevor won, then good. If you say Fields won, then it's like, oh no, throw this thing out. Right. But it's getting you part of the way there. If this it's is, if those, just from what we know, it's probably one of those two guys. Even if you go back to twenty eighteen, okay? Twenty eighteen, we've got what? Darnold, Rosen, Baker, Josh Allen, and Lamar. Yes. Of if you threw all those guys Maybe in a room, Mason Rudolph gets invited. <laughs> threw in 30 prospects. Who are they all gravitating to? 
it's either it's one of the three that are it's one of the two good ones Lamar, in Baker. Allen or Baker. Yeah, it's one of the two good ones in Baker. I could buy that. Um, so, so it's, there, there's a lot of other tests. I like this. I think they've cracked it. I think Let's I think back the crazy new lines. billionaire. 2011, Cam Newton or Blaine Gabbert or Jake Locker. Definitely or Cam Christian Newton. Christian Ponder. Definitely Cam Newton. It's definitely Cam. They're all gravitating to Cam. Now, the problem is when you get to Tebow. They're all gravitating to Tebow. I was thinking about that the other day because I was I was joking on Twitter about how if I when I'm GM, I promise you I will take every quarterback to dinner because I want the steak dinner every year. Sure. I'm going to tell my owners we have to do our due diligence on the QB class. It's really important. And I that think we have this steak. QB class is ten deep this year. Right. So we need at least ten, ten steak steaks. dinners. So I'll go to all of them. And somebody was joking about how when the Patriots brought Tebow in, and they took him out to the to the North End and everything, you know, and took him out. And um, I, I think that was pre-draft. And why, like, if you were Josh, remember Josh McDaniels traded up to go get Tim Tebow that yes. year. And if you had only been around Tom Brady for the last 10 years, mm -hmm. and in your head you're like, I need a guy like this. I need a guy who is so obsessed with getting better. I need, I, I forget the talent, right? Because that's the Tom Brady. Oh, he's not the most talented guy in the world, but you know he's going to outwork everybody. Literally going to do it. He's so obsessed with winning. Like, can't you understand why Josh McDaniels was attracted to Tim Tebow and why the Patriots actually wined and dined him and got to know him and then well, actually signed him a couple years ago. Like, don't you get it? I mean, forget the throwing mechanics and the fact that he wasn't actually good at quarterback, but don't you get it? Like, you think you found the thing that the quarterback needs to be successful and overcome deficiencies. But the other thing is that we never factor in. You also the have to bear end in mind in Boston. You also have to bear in mind what that draft class was, right? This is like when we when we analyze Jimmy the, Clawson. Yeah, when we analyze the um, Julio Jones trade, right? It's like, and compare it to this year. If Buffalo, what if Buffalo does the Julio Jones trade? This year, the draft class of receiver looks absolutely loaded. The draft class of receiver when the Julio Jones trade happened ended at Julio Jones. It's like, it's A.J. Green and Julio Jones, and then there are no more good receivers to be had in this draft, right? The quarterback class when Tim Tebow was drafted Sam Bradford went number one overall, Clearly right? Who was no. a top end prospect, albeit with some injury history already. Uh, then it was Tebow, and then it was Jimmy Clausen, Colt McCoy, Mike Kafka, John Skelton, Jonathan Crompton, whoever the hell that is, Rusty Smith, Dan Lefevre, uh, Tony Pike, Joe Webb, Levi Brown, Sean Canfield. You waiting for it? Zach Robinson. Zach Robinson, seventh rounder. Seventh rounder. Almost. He Jonathan was only. Crompton he was, was only six picks away from being Mr. Irrelevant. For Zach. Good for Zach. Could anyway. Have, could have been the next Brock Purdy. My point being, right, Sam Bradford goes number one overall. You're picking in the first round. You need a quarterback. It's like either I believe in Tim Tebow or I'm screwed because there's nobody else. I mean, Josh McDaniels also, like, booted Jay Cutler out the door. In that. I understand that. Yeah. But my point being, like, you can understand. That already happened, though. You can understand a degree of looking at the landscape and saying, and, and like speaking it into existence, right? It's like I, my two cho choices right now, having already decided I'm getting rid of Jay Cutler, are I believe in Tim Tebow or I'm kind of screwed because my alternatives are Jimmy Clausen and Colt McCoy. All right, let's play this social experiment game again. It's 2020. But you've my, got... my last point on that. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So I think you can dismiss the Tim Tebow year as an absence of alternatives. Desperation. Right? It's like, okay, yeah, that would get you in trouble because you're, you're Sam Bradford versus Tim Tebow, and clearly the room is gravitating towards Tim Tebow over Sam Bradford, right? But I think you can dismiss that in that it's just two options. You know? Here's, here's the other thing I wanted to bring up. Teams have, there's a lot of uh, non wonderlick tests that players are going through, psychology tests and interviews and everything, and they're not, like the wonderlick is like a, it's like a fact-based test, right? There's a right or wrong answer, like and you IQ get a score. Test. Yeah. So, but some of the psychology tests that they take, there's not right or wrong answers, right? So it's it's like it's almost like personality tests. And so I've heard stories of quarterbacks that would go in there, and they're so prepared, in the te and there's no right or wrong answers, and the quarterback will go in there and say, they'll ask like, you know, what's your favorite animal, and they'll just be like, I just love football. Right? Yeah. Like they're so trained by their agents to be like, just tell them you love ball. They need to know that you love football. You, you have to love ball. Right? And, and so they'll, and it's like, no, we'll call him Josh. No, Josh. 
please just answer the question. There's no right or wrong answer. Like they're really just trying to get to the heart of like what type of player they are. Yeah. And sometimes it's like this guy's an introvert, this guy's a leader, this guy's and it's and it's up to a whole bunch of interpreted data points or whatever. So if if you it's two things. Did Washington use all of their 30 visits? If people don't know, a 30 visit, which is sometimes wrongly called a top 30 visit, it's not your top 30 players. You get 30 in-person visits with players. Does this mean Washington used all 30 in one swoop with them? Or this was a this was all of them, right? Yeah, I believe so. So if this you, is the if, first time they've ever done this. If my understanding of Burt's report is to be believed, that is what they did. They got all 30 guys in at the same time, having done all their, their work and the one-on-ones and the Zoom calls and stuff. Their, their use, their deployment of the 30 visits was to bring them all in and put them in a Lord of the Flies environment and see, <laughs> see which quarterback gravitated, they gravitated Who towards. Who grabs the conk. I, I think they've cracked it, right? Josh Harris, the crazy new billionaire, I think has nailed it. Here's another one. Interesting draft class, right? The 2020 draft class. That's what I was going to bring up. Joe yeah. Burrow, yeah. Tua Tagovailoa, Justin Herbert. Uh, Jalen Hurts. Jordan Love. Jordan Love, Jalen. Jalen Hurts. This one's interesting. Joe then you get to Jacob Beeson, blah, blah, blah. But J- Joe gravitating. Burrow and Jalen Hurts would win that one. Yes. I think this thing is – I think they've done it. I think this is the best indicator now. All I need now, if I'm a billionaire, all I want is the S2 score and the top golf test. All That's right, all 2000, I need. 2015, okay. Jameis Winston, Marcus Mariota. Jameis. They're gravitating to Jameis. But they ended up being the same guy. Right, so it doesn't matter. Uh, 2016, Jared Goff, Carson Wentz, Ooh. Paxton Lynch. Ooh. But then if you did invite – but then listen, Connor Cook. Connor and if you invited Dak Prescott, you know Dak wins that. Yeah, probably. But yeah. now this is just hindsight bias. <laughs> it is, yeah. No, well, no. I think most of them so far haven't been. The 2017 one is interesting, which that would be. Because it's 2017 probably, is Mahomes, Trubisky, and Watson. And it's probably one of the latter two. I Watson doubt, and Mahomes? Yeah, yeah. I don't think Trubisky would have won the gravitational, the, the top golf test. I just don't. I don't <laughs> see it. <laughs> the top golf test. How about 2022? Kenny Pickett, <laughs> Sam Howell, Malik That's Willis. That's interesting now. Desmond Ritter. And who am I missing? Sam Howell, Desmond Ritter, uh, Malik Willis. That's it, right? That's it's. There was five. I thought that were. Consi- oh, Matt Corral was the oh, guy Matt we were Corral. thinking of, yeah, yeah. and you know who wouldn't have been invited was Brock Purdy. Correct. Purdy wouldn't have been invited. Sam Howell probably wins that, right? I don't know. This is a guessing game. Yes. I don't know enough about their personalities. Right, but Sam- I, I have a theory sometimes <laughs> that the, the quarterbacks interview. Like you can learn a lot by just how they answer questions and everything, and, and they almost kind of did you play the same way. Did you yeah. see the report? that um, I forget where I didn't I don't remember where I read this from but it was basically suggesting that Sam Howell could not exist as a backup to uh, I think it was specifically Drake May, to Drake May uh, in Washington but they were like he's too much of an alpha like he can the team would just gravitate to Sam Howell you couldn't have him behind a dude who's coming in to try and win that job they're like much of it wouldn't alpha. work we need to get him out of the building because that guy is is too much of a dog. He'll just he'll just take over. It'll be his team. It'll still be his team. You need to get him out of there. So they ship him off to Seattle. Since so I, Sam Howell would have aced the top golf test. He would have been the number one overall pick, or at least number twenty. I don't know if I like the alpha test. I like it. I like the alpha I test. I want to know who got it. No. So Adam Peters is the new general manager. I want to know. Is this something he's been sitting there in San Francisco the last few years and everything? Is this something he's been sitting on for years? Because, you know, every future GM is like, when I'm in the seat, like I do, <laughs> when I'm in the seat, here's how I'm going to do it. This right? Is like you're, uh... you're learning. Like, when I'm in the seat, I'm going to draft with the, I'm, I'm going to draft like this and we're going to win championships. No, this is like your, uh, I'm going to draft like this. This is like your just cover the space thing you had a while ago, you know, or if you just use the hot, the, the heat maps, they were like, here's where, yeah, the, my defensive, here's where the passes are going. My defensive strategy is to not to call coverages, but to simply call where the offense throws the ball, right. cover the hot spots with players. You're going to reinvent effectively zonal coverage, except Correct. instead of like the areas of the field that are drawn up on a chalkboard, you're going to, your zones are going to correspond to heat maps and therefore be better. 
This is right. what this is, right? What, You're yeah, saying Adam, Adam Peters, Peters has is been, this Adam? He's been devising this for the last like six years in a in a dark room somewhere. Going when I'm when I'm running the show, the only thing we're gonna do is Zoom calls and the Top Golf test. Yeah. So I want to know was this, or was this just Josh Harris being like, as, as billionaires tend to do? I read a book. I read a book on the best way to find out the best alpha, and uh, we're gonna do it this way. Because this was like when Adam Peters was interviewing to become GM clearly he was like this must have come up either Adam was like hey this is this big idea I have or Josh Harris was like hey if you get hired by the way here's how we're doing these visits I need to know I could ask real ask Ray. last last uh last uh case study for Let's the see if I can get into top golf test Rick here here you go 2019 Kyler Murray Daniel Jones Dwayne Haskins the late Dwayne Haskins Drew Locke Will Greer, Ryan Finley, Jared Stidham, Easton Stick, Clayton Thorsten. They all uh, lose. Gardner Minshew. The two people that get gravitated to are Kyler Murray and Gardner. This is flawless. This is yet to fail. The only failure for this test has been Tim Tebow, and we can dismiss that as a weird year with only two options. This is absolute hindsight bias. No, it's not. Because, Minshew yes, was Minshew was a bad. If it's so easy to predict, then you need to then predict this year's class at Top Golf. Predict this year's for class. Washington. Okay. If it's so easy, it's easy in hindsight because yeah. we didn't know who uh -huh. knew what Minshew was. Oh, he's going to wear you know jean shorts and travel. That the country. was his entire shtick. Everyone knew Minshew was awesome. Yeah, but the shtick doesn't matter if he doesn't like play decent football, right? It's just like oh, whatever. Like Luke Falk could have been that awesome guy, but no, he, he didn't. He wasn't good at throwing footballs. Not. Luke Falk could not have been that guy. All right. So predictive. If it's so easy to predict, okay. predict the alpha game. This year. Drake May, Jaden Daniels. Who was invited? Is it just the top all three of the, quarterbacks? Every quarterback not named Penix Caleb and Williams, Knicks? I think. Penix, Knicks, and Rattler? Were they all invited? I don't know if Rattler was there. I'm pretty sure all of them. All right, let's pretend they all were. Okay. All right, so everybody up to Rattler is invited. Yeah. Two through seven. Who wins the alpha game this year? The two, the two names would be Penix and McCarthy. Panix and McCarthy would be the out would be the top I golf winners. Definitely think Panix. Yeah. yeah. Panix and McCarthy. Panix reminds me a little winners. bit of Geno Smith with that subtle confidence. Like, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Doubt me. They go ain't ahead. right back. I ain't right back. Yeah. Uh-huh. Panix so has some of that too on my And then I think McCarthy's the other guy. You don't know enough about Drake May. You don't know enough about Drake. I'm telling you. That, look, you're Why you do you hate the Drake? Huh? You hate the Drake. I don't hate the Drake. I just don't think he's winning. Look, if this is a dude, they, his own, the report that I can't remember or verify was that Sam Howell would like out alpha Drake May by a factor of a million. So we got to trade him away. That man's not winning the top golf test. What about Jaden, man? If he can't out alpha Sam Howell, he can't win the test. Jaden had, so I, I, I want to go back through history. This is very, very anecdotal. I'm going to bring this up. Yeah. Jaden Daniels had some teammates at Arizona State. When he left, they basically said, good riddance. They're right. Like, good. See you later. Now, he went to LSU and became a Heisman Trophy winner, had one of the best seasons in college football history last year. So does that actually matter? Josh Rosen came out. People didn't want to go to his birthday. <laughs> teammates didn't want to go to his birthday. <laughs> he would definitely not have won the Alpha Test. He was, he was, he was hot tubbing as a true freshman. You know, yeah. He was an entitled kid. Can't right. do that, right? Wouldn't have won it. Not a chance. Mark Sanchez, Mark Sanchez declared early. Pete Carroll said, I don't know if it's a good idea. His, head, his own head coach at right. USC, I don't said know if no. it's a good idea. Uh -huh. Deshaun Kaiser came out. They asked Brian Kelly, his head coach, say some nice things about Deshaun Kaiser. Didn't do it. Nope. Didn't say some nice things. I'm just saying, anecdotally through the years, the other one I'll use, and I know this didn't perfectly turn out well, but Deshaun Watson, when he came out of Clemson, Dabo Sweeney said, he's Michael Jordan. That dude's, that dude's amazing. Now, he may have had some similar Jordan addiction tendencies as well. So that part of it wasn't great. But as far as on the field, Deshaun Watson for those first few years, Dabo looked good. So very anecdotally, in some of the public statements that coaches have made, there might be some some kernels of truth in there. Similar Jordan addiction tendencies. It's, you really, you love getting us into legal trouble, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just saying. What? Email, email us in with who you think would win the top golf test. You would get, NFL, we'll, cut that, we'll cut that out of the podcast. NFL podcast at pff.com. I think you asked me to predict. I think that JJ McCarthy and Michael Penix would be the top golf winners of the test this year. 
So I have both retroactively proved that it's flawless and predicted the winners this so year. So you've got Michael Penix and J.J. McCarthy, so you would let Drake May drop. Purely based off the alpha test, yes. It's flawless. It, it apparently has no, no flaw. Anyway. Let us know in yes. the chat or in email who wins the alpha test. So Are let you, us move on from that. Um, you have more to talk about? Yeah. The... Oh. Did you see the article, the, the Patriots article, the Bill Belichick, uh, the latest Bill Belichick? Why did Bill Belichick not get a job this year? The fact that he's unemployable, apparently. Uh, it was fascinating. The, they kind of documented the, the interview process with Atlanta, which obviously featured the yacht, um, as all good billionaire stories do. He had his interview on the yacht. He thought the job was his. And it turns out he wasn't even in the top three of the Falcons sort of brass. They had a vote. They literally were asked to rank their options. Who do you want as head coach? One, two, three. Belichick did not appear in the top three of this list, which apparently went Raheem Morris, number one, uh, Mike, Mike McDonald. McDonald, number two, and PFF Bobby, Bobby Slowick, number three. I've ahead. always said Bobby was a better coach than Bill Belichick. Exactly. I always said that. And Bill Belichick not in the rankings. Um, but, but it features some interesting nuggets. Uh, number one, <laughs> Belichick effectively just wants to bring the same old coaches with him. Yeah, we'll get, you know, Patricia and Joe Judge and, and uh, Josh McDaniel. They get the whole band back together. Uh, and they were asked, like, he was apparently asked, like, why had they failed outside of New England? You know, why are all, why are all these guys bad when you're not there? To which he apparently said they're better soldiers than generals, which I'm sure they're, they're very pleased to see written out there, you know, put out there in the public sphere. It's kind of true. I mean, it might be. It's just, it's an interesting thing to drop. Uh, Belichick apparently asked the Falcons why they didn't have uh, workout bonuses in their contracts. You know, he, one of the things that he'd like to do in New England was put workout bonuses to get everybody in the, in the offseason and foster this team building environment. He asked the Falcons why they didn't do that. And they really don't do that. They're like dead ass last, I think, in terms of guaranteed money that they give out for those things. To which they apparently replied, no, yeah, we've just never done it in Atlanta. You know, he's, he's, he's never done it here, which is a terrible answer to any question. Uh, but nonetheless, the one that he received. Um, and it was basically saying the other sort of nugget in this was that Robert Kraft and, and Arthur Blank are billionaire buddies. They're apparently very tight. And it effectively said that Robert Kraft just smeared Belichick to Arthur Blank on the phone. It was like, nah, you know what, this guy can't trust him. Can't trust him is what it was said. Yeah. So the part... I mean, I think the, the, at the time when it happened, it felt like, well, Atlanta's not ready to completely buy in and give Belichick all the power because that's essentially what it would need to be. But it did. So the other thing in this article, which isn't, it doesn't sort of appear in any of the aggregator, you know, headlines slash takeaways from the piece because it's harder to discern, I think. But one of the most important pieces of information, I think, in that article was that Belichick was happy to give up that power. Like they are... Because that, that when you're analyzing it at the time, you're like, dude, it's a tough sell for a dude of Belichick's age for a team to just toss the keys to him and say, go nuts, right? Reorganize the thing however you want it done. All the powers to you. He apparently was perfectly willing to sort of say, I will work with the GM. I'm not, I don't want, in fact, I'm eager to give up the GM side of it and just be head coach Bill Belichick again. Now, the counter to that is they're like, well, he might say that, but ultimately if it's like, which guy are you going to listen to, Bill Belichick versus like second year GM, it's going to end up being him the whole way anyway. Now, that says maybe, but at least theoretically, Belichick was not demanding that kind of control. In fact, was eager to cede that type of control and work with a general manager. That's interesting to me. I just don't know. Yeah, I don't know how well that would work. Same, but that, like, that I think is a pretty important piece of information that, like, he's not, you know, this is not a, that's not a, a prerequisite to hiring Bill Belichick, the head coach, is you got to get, you know, you got to be a team without a GM, you got to cede all control to him, yada, yada. It doesn't appear that that's the case. I, I feel like it was, I think the bottom line, no matter what the information was, it came down to the age thing, right? It's like Belichick. I think that's a big part of it. So Belichick was going to say, we're going to get the band back together. Yep. That means I need to, we're, we're firing everybody. We're bringing in this whole new group. It's my group. There's no successor in this group because yes. he just called them soldiers, soldiers not generals. Right. And I'm going to – and it's it's a two- or three-year rebuild. Maybe maybe it's closer because it's Atlanta and they, they have a good roster. But Belichick still has a very specific type of player that he likes. And, would you know, so they're going to have to overhaul the roster. 
So I think that was probably, at the end of the day, the biggest issue. And then, and, the, and again, the most recent thing that they saw was four years of below average play from the Patriots. Four straight years. Yeah. One good year in there, but four straight years, the totality of post Tom Brady has been pretty poor in New England. And so that's the most recent thing that they saw in Atlanta, I think rather it, than getting, you know, more of like an upstart younger coach. Yeah, I think a big determining factor is is was the feeling that the that Belichick is a short term option. There was right. a suggestion within the article that Belichick is basically only interested in fifteen more wins to pass on Shula and then he's out, right? Like he said previously that he didn't want to coach into his 70s. He's deep into it, not deep. He's into his 70s now. Yeah. So either he's completely changed his mind on that or he's trying to chase that number and then he's out. And if that, that becomes a much tougher sell. If it's like we could bring in Belichick, completely overhaul the structure of the building in some way, shape or form, even if we're not, you know, ceding all general manager power to him. It's a fairly significant overhaul to just make it, the Belichick way, right, for like a two-year thing. And then he's going to bounce because he's past Shula. And now, now what do we do? There's no success. can't turn it over to Josh McDaniels because apparently he's the worst head coach of all time and is only a, a soldier, <laughs> not, a, not a general, yeah. right? So we're screwed. Like, none of these guys are the guy. So now we've got to do the whole thing over again. And at least, like they were saying, <laughs> Arthur Blank hates head coach searches. So we just didn't want to do another one in two years' time. I do still think... I, there, it'll, a team will get desperate enough to give Belichick another shot. I mean, they were connecting him with Dallas in a year's time. You know, Jerry Jones has let Mike McCarthy essentially do the last year of his deal. Now, next year, the conversation is not, do I fire him or not? It's, do I renew his deal or not, which right. is a different dynamic. So maybe it's Jerry. Maybe another team just goes, this is so much of a mess, you know, and, and reboots again. It's like, how do we stop this cycle? Belichick. I think he'll get another shot. It makes sense from the talented teams. I think the most common rumors are the Cowboys and the Eagles. Yeah. Teams that you know are going to have talent. Like if the Eagles collapsed again the way they did this year, you know? Because yeah. th- it, it was like on the one hand, Sirianni took them to a Super Bowl like a year ago. On the other hand, this collapse was so insane, it has to fall at the door of the head coach. Like if that happened again this year, number one, Sirianni would be gone. And number two... Like he has, Belichick has connections with, Ro, with Howie Roseman. I could definitely see Belichick saying, I trust Howie Roseman. I yeah. trust him building the team. Right. Again, there's some major differences in how they build their team sure. and stylistically. And even though in my mind, I tend to pigeonhole Belichick into like he has his own scheme in his way, he's also been very uh, capable of adjusting through the years, right? Yeah. Man versus zone. The thing he generally likes is a certain you know, size and physicality to his players, more less so than like the undersized get up the field type of defensive players. But I'm sure he can adjust if how he's making the yeah, call. Yeah, from there. a personnel point of view, I actually think it would be the best thing for him to see control to somebody that knows what they're doing and just say, here are the ingredients we've bought you, make the most of it. Because yeah. that's his that's been his strength as a coach throughout the years is taking players that can only do a specific thing and not making them do other things, right? Like he would have specific horses for specific courses guys that play man coverage well on the back end guys that play zone coverage well on the back end and belichick is the guy that's willing to change the starting lineup week to week because this week we want more zone coverage so you're going to be the starter this week we want more man coverage so we're flipping it like he's actually perfect for that it's it's more the what does he want to do from a um from a sort of cultural you know, team construction standpoint and how much of a pain is that going to be? There's also the idea that he's been a old school disciplinarian, you know, shouty type of coach. And that doesn't seem to be a thing anymore, really. Those guys, I mean, where are they? I want to play the QB alpha game a little bit more. 2014, ready? People will love that. Blake Bortles. Yeah. Johnny Football. Ooh. Teddy Bridgewater. Okay. Derek Carr. Jimmy G. It's Teddy and Johnny Football. Yeah. But Derek Carr and Jimmy G are the two best quarterbacks from that class. Uh, the most productive part because Teddy's knee fell apart on him. Yeah. And the other part being – so here's the thing, right? Johnny Football, it's the test didn't fail you. 
because Johnny Football could have been good. He was just a lunatic. He just didn't study his playbook. Exactly. Yeah. Ever. So he's, <laughs> and he was like, actually only good at the alpha game. Yeah. That's and, the only thing he right, was good at. And was like a drug addict. And, a, you know, Johnny Football went off the rails not because he, was a good, he wasn't a good football player. The fact that Johnny Football now made it to excuses. the NFL with his problems – Shows you how how talented a player he was. Fair. In fact, the alpha it, that's a success story for the alpha test. The fact that he won a Heisman Trophy is madness. 2012, Andrew Luck, RG3, Ryan Tannehill, yeah. Brandon Whedon, and then if you want to extend it to Brock Osweiler, Russell Wilson, Nick Foles, Kirk Cousins. What a class. It's just luck. Luck wins. Luck wins? Everyone gravitates to luck. Everyone loved that dude. Because they only gravitated to him because he was anointed as the no, top quarterback prospect. No, people love Luck. People always loved that guy. He had the RG3, thing. Your, RG3 would have won that. No, Luck would have won. 100% Luck would have beaten RG3. No. People loved Andrew Luck to an irrational degree at every step of his life. That was because of his no, talent. No, it's not. So he had – this is the thing. The difference between Andrew Luck and Trevor Lawrence is that people loved Andrew Luck with that – the the crown with the crown that had been placed on his head from like the age of 12 people still loved him people didn't love Trevor Lawrence with that let me just say two things here Russell Wilson comes across as corny these days yes but he had I think people really liked him he might have had a good a good group then Kirk in at Michigan State I remember at Big Ten media days (laughs) there were people who were like that dude is so well spoken yeah he is unbelievable like he is going to be president someday like that type of um, very good at commanding a room and everything. Like but that's Kirk, very different to teammates. I understand, but he had that, and maybe it, maybe it would have worked with teammates. Teammates love him in Minnesota now, so maybe Kirk, maybe there would have been some signal there if Kirk was invited to Top Golf in 2012. I'm telling you, RG3 was seen as that guy. He would as not have had a bigger charismatic, and people loved him. I think, I mean, I think he, whatever, he says some stuff these days where he's kind of all over the place. But I think at the time, RG3 maybe wins the Alpha Not game. Not a chance. He would have had a group, but the winner of that would absolutely have been Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck would have had the largest body of humans with him, and then there would have been small splinter factions with RG3, Kirk, and Russ, I think, before people figured out that Kirk and Russ are really corny. Like, I would have taken a while. But I think the teammates in the, the uh, alpha test would I don't been, want to stop playing this game. We're, with them. We're going, listen, I'm, go, I'm going back to 04. Dude, I'm the chat do, is going to lose their I mind. I don't care. Keep they can, you guys can leave. <laughs> 2008, Matt Ryan, Joe Flacco, yeah. Brian Brom, uh-huh. and Chad Henney, and Kevin O'Connell are all invited. They're the top five quarterbacks off the board. Ryan wins. Matt Ryan? Yeah. Matt, Ryan Matt Ryan's not winning an alpha game. Do you even remember what Matt Ryan was coming out of Boston College? That people loved that, that he would have won easily. Easily. You're just making stuff up. I'm not. Matt okay. Ryan. This is where it gets fun. The Matty Ice nickname came from college, not from the NFL. That dude was seen as, like, the guy. 07. Yeah. Jamarcus Russell. Oh, no. Brady Quinn. <laughs> Kevin Cobb. Oh, God. And John Beck. It's a is it crazy to say Kevin Cobb would have won that? Nobody wins. Nobody wins. You're right. That would have been just equal. Four collections. It would have been completely would just No pattern would have emerged. Everybody passes. No pattern would have emerged. It here's would have just been people all Here's over where the it place. fails. Here's where it fails. 2006. Vince Young. No, I already know who wins. Matt Leinart. Yeah. Jay Cutler. Those are the three. The three big ones. Yeah, Vince There's, Young wins. That's fine. Matt Leinart would win that. What? Matt Leinart would absolutely. He Are was, you out of your mind? He was a Southern Cal celebrity. That's, People not, wanted, that's why he doesn't win. That's why everybody wanted to hang out. Vince up. Young coming off that national championship game. Texas, no, the Rose. Matt Leinart Vince won that. Young wins that in a landslide. Matt Leinart would have won that. You are out of your freaking mind. Matt, Ryan, or Matt Leinart. People would have looked at him and gone, I'm not siding with that like that Southern Cal media darling with the nice hair. Vince Young is my guy. I am hanging out with him. You are crazy if you think Matt Leiner wins that year. Also in that draft class, Kellen Clemens, Tavares Jackson, Charlie Whitehurst, Bruce Gradkowski's <laughs> down there. Jesus. Bruce would have had a little group with him. Bruce, yeah. now that he's a motivational speaker. No, he's just a fun guy. He would have, people would have gone to Bruce. Bruce is fun, yeah. Bruce would have had Bruce would have had one of those Russ Wilson little cliques, you know. It would have been Vince Young with everybody with him. Matt Lyon, you're out of your mind. And then Bruce would have had a little group. 
All right, I, I got. It. I just wanted to get back to 04. So give me uh, 05, <laughs> Alex Smith, Aaron Rodgers, yeah, Jason Campbell. Huh, that one's tough. Jason Campbell might have won that year. Aaron Rodgers was a big dork back then. Yes. So Alex Smith. And Alex Smith was kind of nerdy as well. I don't think he'd. Have, I think it might have been Jason Campbell. Am I going to get sued by Rodgers now too? Rodgers got bigger can't problems. Just call He's him a busy dork. trying to figure out HIV and stuff. Don't, don't worry about it, Rodgers. Um, I think Jason Campbell might have won that year. That, that's a problematic data point for the, the Alpha test. 05 is not good for it. Now, yeah. 04, we know three really good quarterbacks came. Four really actually came out of it. Eli Manning, yeah. Phillip Rivers, yeah. Ben Roethlisberger, yeah. J.P. Lossman, Ooh. and then Matt Schaub was the next QB off the board in round three. I think Josh that... Harris was also in that draft out of Bowling Green. Not the owner. Not the owner, right? Because that would have been a hell of an arc. They also had Jeff Smoker, John Navarre, and Cody Pickett as late round picks. So I think, I think Rivers and Roethlisberger win that. Eli's too. Eli, no. Eli only became Eli after the rings. Yeah. Eli's not winning. JP Lossman's certainly not winning. As I was re watching the 04 draft, uh, Eli did come across. He's like, I, he's like I'm holding on. I don't want to sign with the Chargers. And this is my decision. Right. I, I swear it's my decision. He was assuring people that this was not Archie telling him to right. do this. And not a single human being believed him. Nobody believed him. Um, I think it probably would have been Rivers with the biggest and then Roethlisberger second and then everyone else at distant. So depending on perspective, Rivers and Roethlisberger were clearly better quarterbacks than Eli Manning, but Eli had the two Super Bowl runs. That seemed very difficult to predict. What? I'm just going to let that be your definition of the outcome of that draft and say nothing. Rivers and Roethlisberger were better quarterbacks than Eli Manning, right? I am saying nothing. No one disagrees with that. <laughs> I think you'll find that's very not true. All right, 0-2. Oh, 2 oh, two, God. And then I'm going to go 0-1, and that's it. Come on. David Carr in 0-2. David Carr. David Carr. Joey Harrington. Nobody even remembers these quarterbacks. Joey Har- Do you have any oh, idea how far ago 2002 was? I just rewatched it. Yeah. There were a bunch of our listeners who weren't alive mind. when this draft it's happened. Fresh in my mind. Uh, David Carr, yeah. I loved him. Joey Harrington, yeah. Patrick Ramsey, Josh McCown in round four. And then David Garrard in round four. This oh, is, McCown was round three. Sorry. This is potentially another problematic day. It's point. problematic, yeah. Um, and then 01 was Michael Vick, Drew Brees, Quincy Carter. Vick wins. Uh, and that would the, have been wrong because Drew Brees was in that mix. Wouldn't have been wrong. Just give me the uh, give me O two again. Uh, David Carr, yeah. Joey Harrington, Patrick Ramsey. I think that would have been Carr and Ramsey, equally. So, like again, hindsight's really clear. Joey it's not Harrington because I just rewatched it. Definitely again. not Joey. Joey Harrington's interview after getting drafted by the Lions at three overall was something to the effect of, man, I didn't know I was going to go this high, but I'm excited. Basically, like, I didn't think I was going in the top three. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's like red flag right away. Definitely wouldn't have been Joey. In 2000. What? Would we have predicted Tom Brady if he was playing top golf with Chad Pennington? Honestly, you might have. I know. Seriously. Chad Pennington, Giovanni Carmazzi, <laughs> Chris Redman, T. Martin, Mark Bulger, Spurgeon Wynn, <laughs> And Tom Brady. <laughs> I Brady, yes. Brady would have had he would have had that. I think T. Martin, T. Martin's become a very good wide receivers coach. T. Martin may have been the guy. What? T. Martin also, after Peyton Manning, I'm more interested. Could not win the big one. T. Martin comes in, goes undefeated, they win the national title. After Peyton Manning. T. Martin would have maybe won that one. Pennington's no, probably I think good too. Uh, yeah, so I think I think Pennington would have had a group. I think Brady absolutely would have had a group. I'm more interested in that draft. Would the alpha test have identified uh, who was I look at? Mark Bulger? It wouldn't, right? I don't think. No way Bulger's getting a group. I don't think so. The people doubting Brady in that sense, I, I think you got to go back to like early Brady stories because he was like yeah. a party animal, but always worked hard. And he, was also, shot, he would shotgun beers better than everybody. Like teammates, teammates loved, loved Tom him. Brady right away. Teammates loved Teammates him. loved Tom Brady. Yeah, they really did. Right off the bat. So there was something there. Uh, Tim Couch, Donovan McNabb, Achilles Smith, Dante Culpepper, Cade McDown. Tim, K- oh, God. Tim Couch, it's Donovan weird. McNabb, Achilles Smith, Dante Culpepper, Cade McNown. I would, I'm going to say McNabb and Culpepper, but it's hindsight. Yeah. 
It's not. Tim Couch could go either way because on the one hand he was probably quite fun, on the other hand he appears to have been, you know, not the sharpest tool in the drawer. Yeah, that's probably not helping. All right, that's all we're doing. Yes, thank you. That's all we're doing. This is fun. So your prediction is in this in this game. It's very clearly Penix Jr. and JJ McCarthy. It's very clearly Penix Jr. and I think JJ McCarthy is the other winner. I definitely think Penix. Bo Nix? No. I think people would like Bo. No, Bo Nix not winning this. I think you're probably right. I don't know enough about Drake May to comment positively or negatively, though. I feel like I sense it more with Penix and JJ. But isn't this just they had the teams that won? No. How much is this? They had the teams that won and went to the national title. That doesn't matter. So, of course, their teams love them. No. This is not a waste of time because uh, the show is supposed to be over. I mean, and what else am I going to Consider do? this bonus material. This is bonus. The show this ended is... about 15 minutes yeah, ago. Yeah, the show's been over and, for And a we're while. just entertaining ourselves by talking about the alpha test. This is absolutely bonus material. Yeah. I will remind everybody. So a couple things. i got a couple announcements here. Um, your bets. I want your bets. And maybe bets aren't the best way to parse this thing. But it is your predictions for the NFL draft. We will collect them all. And if they are bold enough... Yes, bold will, predictions. Bold predictions that you feel real strongly about. And if they come true, we'll give you a year of uh, PFF+. Plus. So NFL Podcast at pff.com. You can uh, tag us in a tweet and everything too. Uh, hashtag vault me. It's still live. Is hashtag it? vault me. Yeah, you got to just search it. People still use it. Right, but is the last tweet using it from like 19... Doesn't matter. People still use it during draft season. I started it back in 2012. <laughs> and it's still going. So hashtag vault me. Here's a question for predictions. you. Here's a question for you. If the if the PFF office used the alpha test, who would win? Who's <laughs> gravitated to in well, there's no one in the office anymore. Okay, but assuming everyone was in the office, Trash. Who, who would win? Trash? Trash is not winning the alpha test. Likeable guy. Get, no, stop it right now. So let's say like the heyday of Okay, the heyday. Bruce is still getting Bruce is still a leader in the clubhouse. He's still getting a lot. And he only showed up on Tuesdays. That's what I'm saying. But he would buy us lunch, so that's a big part of it. Yeah. Bruce would have a big group. Definitely. I don't want to say the answer because he turned <laughs> out to be a very uh, – he, he was uh, magnetic, and then he became a uh, uh, backstabbing turncoat. Wow. So. I think – I won't say it. I think I think the late Austin Gale would have a shot. Austin Gale, magnetic. Yeah, yeah, he's good. I'm not, that's not the backstabbing turncoat Correct. I'm talking about. I think the late Michael Renner would have a shot. Just because he was handsome. He's a little bit – he would have a smaller group. Austin would be – so – Yeah, Austin, Austin had Austin had that alpha. Austin alpha. and Bruce. Definitely not my, me. Nobody liked me. No. Austin was, and Bruce would be my two suggestions, I think. Yeah, that's fair. Austin and Bruce. Uh, was with. there anyone else in the office at the time? Jeff Beers. Jeff. Jeff. <laughs> marketing team only for the stories jeff had yeah. good stories people don't know who he is so it's not nobody so, knows but i think austin and austin and bruce are my two suggestions bruce Gorakowski and the late austin gale currently at the ringer yeah yeah those would be the two see yeah, this is we should have worked hard to keep austin over here i'm telling you the this the alpha test works i have the alpha test at pff predicted a guy who's running like content for the ringer and a dude who's offensive coordinator for the st louis Battlehawks in the ufl He's like buddies with you, the rock. I don't know if you I don't know if you'd predict this properly. I don't know if you'd predict it. Yeah. That's what the alpha test would have said. Nobody he, else done better than that. The old alpha test used to be is was he a team captain? They used to just ask, was he a team captain? All right. right. This is just a more sophisticated way of doing that. All right. Is that it for the show? So the other thing I wanted to announce. Announce. Uh, I'm uh, I'm teaching a class. What? Teaching a class. In what? Uh, PFF. You're teaching a class in PFF. Yeah, it's part of uh, sports management worldwide. You can learn PFF, PFF Ultimate. Might actually get access to PFF Ultimate for about eight weeks huh. while I walk you through it through uh, sportsmanagementworldwide.com. So okay. I'll be tweeting it. I'll be tweeting out more information, but I'm the uh, professor for the <laughs> class, you see? And you can join and learn about PFF. Like week one, what is PFF and PFF Ultimate? What do the grades mean? How to scout players, game plan, teach you how to do that in Ultimate. And a lot of people sign up for these courses through SMWW to prepare for future careers in sports, in football, whatever it might be. So, All right. You want to take it? No. You should take the class. 
I don't want to learn Learn from something from me. I don't want to do that. So uh, it starts on May 13th. Just keep an eye. It's on Zoom, one hour a week, and uh, some homework and everything. But, you know, I'll, uh, I'll tweet it out for everybody to, uh, to check out. But let me know if you're interested. Okay. Be great. Not you in particular, Sam. Yeah, I don't Others. want it. Others. I don't want it. All right. Is that it for us? Yeah, we're out finally. All right. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. So uh, let me just plan out next week's draft week. Yep. Monday mock draft. Yes. We're going to do the viewer mock. Can you stomach it? Can you handle it? Yeah. We're going to do a viewer mock draft. This is your mock draft, viewers. So you need to be listen. here. So you got to be in Populate the live the chat. chat. And what we've done in the past, we'll give you four options. You vote on the player. 9 a.m. Eastern. 9 a.m. Eastern. Monday is the viewer mock draft. So we will be interacting with the chat. We'll be giving you options. You vote for it, the whole deal. Yep. Uh, Wednesday, we'll be doing our uh, bold draft predictions. Yep. Put your money where your mouth is for the draft. Thursday's pre-recorded. We're going to have Drake May. Not Drake May. We're going to have Nate Tice talking about Drake yeah. May. <laughs> and we're going to have Bruce Feldman. So we have both Nate Tice, Bruce Feldman, both from The Athletic, on Thursday's show during the day, Thursday night, this YouTube channel. Make sure you're subscribed. We're live on the air. Sam and I, along with Trevor, we're going to be with you nonstop, day one and two, live on YouTube. Then we'll have day three coverage with some others as well. And then Sam and I are live after the draft Thursday night. So as soon as the draft ends Thursday night, round one, we're going to go live with our official PFF NFL podcast show and review of round one. So that's what's happening next week. Be ready to go. It's draft week, everybody. All right, thanks to everybody for tuning in. We'll see you again next week, Monday, for some more PFF NFL podcast.